So tell me about this. How's the trolling? Well, I'm having a blast with Liz. Huh? But a couple of things happened in the last week. I have finished one tutorial in it, and I'm... One tutorial? I got all the way through it, yeah, but it's a pretty extensive one, and I played with it, and I got a... I'm, I'm, and then I'm into a book that I'm having fun with and really enjoying. What book? The one that you saw, it's called The Schemer's Guide. On, it's a, another tutorial okay. on Lisp. And... Um, Thank you. Thank you, David. And... Uh, Let's see. So then I, I had a thought this week uh, that uh, I'm, I'm right at that point where I need to take what I've learned and start doing something with it. Why? For fun. Okay. Yeah. Like there's some data files I want to massage, and uh, that'd be a perfect place to start. Ah. To apply it. To apply it, yeah. yeah. Ah. So... Um, what will that do for your goal? That's another step towards the goal. Definitely. It okay. raises it to the next level. Okay. okay. Um, but I had... Uh, so I'm moving along with it and enjoying it. It's So far it's fine. I haven't reached that point which is usually really threatening. Which is when not only do I know how to do things at a basic level and I can get stuff done, but then I want to move up to an even higher, more excellent level. It'll take a while to get to that, but that's the challenging point. Is when when I feel I'm reaching that's some kind I mean. of real excellence yeah. or something. Yeah. So when we get at what like point in the tutorial Sorry, will that be? <laughs> well, I don't think the yeah, tutorial will be that. Long. Long. I think <laughs> the point will be when I see. jump into work, inventing things and myself. Oh, inventing yeah. things myself. Like I can see myself transcending anything that I have seen done before. Tell me, what kind of project would best challenge that? What would, what do you want to... Something what, what that would wanna, involve... Oh. I don't know yet because there is a thing in Lisp called macros. Macros were part and parcel of the language because when they invented this language it was for artificial intelligence oh. and it was their naive assumption that you could write a you could write a program that would think like a human, right? No. They found out this was not doable. Yeah, no. But macros in Lisp are pieces of code that actually write other pieces of code. Woo! And I've never done anything like that. Woo! So and they're a little bit complicated and people find that if they go back to someone else's program and that person wrote a macro it makes it more difficult to follow what that person was doing because you have to think in your head, wait, this macro creates this, which creates that, and it, it may be recursive. And when the whole thing is compiled, it's this massive program, but it was very easy for the initial guy to write. Uh, I can't wrap my head around how I would use macros in my work yet. No, I'll help them. But I'd like to get there because if I could find a project that could use that, yeah. I would think that's beginning to, and then use it fluidly, like not just one thing, but several things, and begin to think in terms of, like change my thinking in terms of macro so that I'm raising to a higher level, not just what we call, um, what's the word for just, just daily level grunt work. You can get things done, it's fine. But it's yeah. not except Yeah, you want to go. Yeah. So I have survived for years on being a very competent programmer at that daily level. No good. Quotidian, I think they call it. No more good. Right. No more. I, so, I'm, so this language is the vehicle for that. I just have to find the job. There is an immediate job I want to do, which is matching graduate students to professors each quarter for... Um, they call it, we call it TA matching, and right now I'm using a Java program which I borrowed from some engineering students in Nebraska. I was but I want to rewrite that in Lisp because it's potentially a very <laughs> recursive <laughs> algorithm. <laughs> this student doesn't go with this teacher, <laughs> some other student bumps them out. Okay, recurse back and pull them out and put someone else in and then redo the algorithm down another branch. Lisp is perfect for that. Mm. But would macros be useful there? I don't know. We'll find out. That's the punch. I think that's what David is mistaken for. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, what's the book? The book you're in? The Schemers guy. Oh, the Faders? <laughs> what, which one? So. Stop. Um, I wanted to. As long as we're talking about that. The thoughts that come up when doing scheme, lisp, or piano, ah, I don't wanna. It's kind of like a child's voice. Or, I have to do it. I have to. Uh, now I have to do it, and then I, I kind of, but if I change that to, I want to, it's fun, mm -hmm. then I get over that. But the instant that I feel that I have to push myself to do it, and it, it's not fun anymore, yes. then I get that. Uh, that. That's the danger. Yeah. Where did that voice come from? I think sitting at piano or sitting at clarinet when I was a kid, and my parents would say, you, you have to do your hour of practice. Yeah, this is not running, Yanni, because... Uh, There's the other tripod right there. No, no, no card, right? Oh, it's going now. You threw it in? Yeah. Okay. So, um, <laughs> and let's connect the audio. Uh, <laughs> Look at that thing. So, there you have it. And what I really thought this week was, okay, piano and lisp are great goals. But what I'd really like to do is Phaedrus and meditate each morning with a little yoga beforehand. Have you shared with your colleagues that you found some people involved in the separation of the soul from the body? Oh, I think I told one or two people, but I haven't shared it to the whole group. Uh, didn't hear about the might be worthwhile. That was a that 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 is another big goal that I'm working on. That's right. I found yeah, a, what's up? Hi, Pierre. What are you into? Gina, here's the update list of a, and a, and a, uh, I found three uh, three different authors who, in the last 20, 30 years, have found a, have rediscovered a number of uh, uh, yogic exercises to get yourself out of the body without drugs, um, usually at night or in the middle of the afternoon um, by going through some relaxation exercises. And Good times for, to do that. I'm not busy during those times. Can I, can I interrupt, Pierre? Can I interrupt? Uh, I wanted, I had asked Pierre to sign these two books. Well, I asked you if, but I'm going to have to leave. And so I, what? I'm going to have to leave. Oh. So I would like to. I'm sorry. That's okay. Just uh, I know. Has a pen if you need you it. Got a pen? I don't have a pen. Here you go. Steve has a I'm sorry. What what should be in it? Whatever you'd like. One of us uh the who 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 <laughs> this one Oh, is a, I see. This one is to Haley and she wants to be a philosopher, so that's my Oh that's very neat. So sorry. H-A-L. H-A-Y-L-E-Y. That's an L. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's an L. Oh, I can't buy one. I was in 
I mean, completely in the fourth. With um, what's the guy who died up here the, at Crystal Cathedral? Schuler. Oh, Schuler. Schuler, like. Who Schuler? Pardon? Reverend Schuler. What are you talking about? I said the graduation was on. Uh, oh, a reenact. Um, like going to the Crystal Cathedral. Is that where you're going? Hello. No, that's oh, where at the end. Thank you so much. I'm I'm free. I'm saved. I'm liberated. That's what I meant. I was in the fourth. These are special. Ah. Coconut and chocolate. And Is that the macaroon? It's called a magic bar. Unfortunately, I can't share it with you because it's too magical. It's big enough. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I was kind of hoping for more. But. Oh, oh yeah. Look at that. Oh, yeah. that it's, it's a meal. That's awesome. Just don't leave it there. <laughs> Make sure you put it. Bye bye. I, I would love to. That may be one of the things that you really disappear. I have to go pick up at 11 o'clock. Oh. Sam. This one is to my uh, <coughs> other niece who got her master's degree and uh, she wants to be a veterinarian. No, oh, was I was in the fourth all night. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. How well? You know that guy Schuler from the Crystal Cathedral. Yeah. Well, that's they had his brother at the uh, graduation. I'm joking. I'm, not, I'm joking about brother, but that was the format. It's a very Christian university. What university is that? Azusa Pacific. Oh yeah. Which one? Azusa Pacific. You know Azusa? Yeah. yeah. Is it a law school or what? No, it's a university. Private university. Totally religious. I know the choral instructor there. Oh. He's my old voice coach, and yes, he is a thoroughly Christian dude. And There's a couple actually, of those. But he can still teach you how to sing rather well. Yay! The choral was beautiful. They didn't have any words to it. It was just very harmonious. That was the best part of the evening. <laughs> I'll let you guys go. Okay, back. have a thank good you. one. Thank you. Eat lots of wedding cake. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And our funeral cake. Or you were exploring <laughs> something. So, yeah, another a goal that yeah. I had set. In so, the like you didn't quite finish. You got to no. um, two or three authors in the last. In the last 30 or 40 years who somehow managed in the afternoons or the evenings to invoke certain postures and achieve certain states of mind. And get out of their body and 
uh, at various levels, explore the local physical world outside of their body and then higher physical worlds. And at first, uh, what happened with, what I noticed that happens with all of them is that they start out doing stuff like that. Go visit my friend, go to Mars, see what the, the moon looks like. But they each, they get tired of this and they start finding out that if they start asking more interesting questions while they're out of the body already, um, like who am I and what is the nature of the cosmos? Um, uh, and why are we here and so forth? Uh, they get taken to higher and higher uh, states of mind uh, while out of the body. Um, and have more and more profound experiences than just buzzing around the universe. Um, but they contend, uh, and as far as I can tell, none of them have ever read Plato, but they, you know. Good for them. There's a map for them, right? But they, they've rediscovered it all on their own, and they contend that if, uh, that everybody can do it. It might take you weeks or months to have your first experience, but you just keep going through these and also try to do meditation and, and clean up your life in other ways. It helps. Um, um, but that they all come to the conclusion that if everybody were reminded or taught at an early age as children how to get out of the body, uh, our planet would be a very, very different place because of all the conclusions that we that we've come to as humans, forgetting that we're thinking that we're the body, but we're not. Yeah. Have you been in touch with those people? Yes. And what kinds of uh, approach do they use for the separation of the soul from the body? There is actually a Panoply of there's a there's a whole there are more methods than you can count that have worked for people and I can list I can list some of them if you like but there's a lot there's, yeah. there's a lot and so. in the end they come to the conclusion that what works for you may not work for someone else so just keep trying different methods until you hit one that, that works for you but uh, they all say that when they were growing up I think what's common to all three of these guys is that they had spontaneous out-of-body experiences when they were young. It scared the shit out of them at first. Later they learned to enjoy and explore and find that it was meaningful. But when, they, when each one of them went out into libraries and into the world to find, as Americans, to find what anybody knew about this, uh, they found nothing. So this has just been in the last 30 years that each of them has published and said, now again, <laughs> we have thousands of years of Plato and Indian yogic practices and so forth, but apparently they either didn't look there or didn't see it relevant to their... So they wrote books and they... Uh, actually, all three of them now have started up institutes to help people with seminars and help you with workshops to, to get out. Question. Ah, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. You got to try one. One, one. Good with coffee, I bet. Oh, because you have three. Go ahead. This is what I live on. What do you want? Thank you. You can't. I'll pass it to Yanni. I'm still. Well, he's saying you can do better philosophy once you separate the soul from the body. It, who, who are these? Who are these people? They're three yoga. different American, three different American authors. They live in Orange County. One has passed away, but lived in Virginia. Was started out as a, an electrical engineer, uh, Bob Monroe. Now there's a, the Monroe Institute, TMI, that's in Virginia. 
Um, another one is William Buhlman, B-U-H-L-M-A-N. Um, I think he's also in engineering in some way, not sure, but he's got several books also. Don't know where he lives, but he travels all over the place. And he's also associated with the Monroe Institute, but they came, they started separately. And a third guy, I have read his book, I can't remember his name, um, uh, is also separate from them, also American. He um, started out helping people to get out of the body on uh, internet uh, Usenet groups, uh, news groups, and then ended up um, uh, combining all the all the various information he had given to people into a book and then selling it as a book. Um, but he also has seminars. Um, the name doesn't come to mind right away. But yeah, they're all Americans. I you know believe. what the problem with that is? That I like very few of my neighbors. <laughs> and so for me to get out of my body and then go visit my neighbors or take a walk around the neighborhood doesn't seem like the best use of my time. <laughs> well, that's the conclusion they come to. Um, <laughs> they, um, that's the, what they find is that there's actually levels of this. That's what you said. And that's the absolute lowest level. And then point. you said when they started yeah. asking questions. Yeah, they get tired with it pretty quickly. Do they suggest, because if you're going to get out of your body of experience, then why go back and visit the body? Eight is what I'm asking. You know, go go look around and kick stones down the walk and stuff. All right. I'm curious about Mars or something. Well, but what kind of um, questions are most amenable to out of body experiences, such that the two work together? I don't know if that's. Did you have a? Uh any of you guys brought a Play-Doh paper, paperback Play-Doh? Yeah, uh, yeah, I can. No, don't, don't, yeah. The paperback one, the Rouse. Oh, yeah. Quick. Nice, Steve. Nice, Steve. Nice one. Nice. The paper is for Doug. Here you go. Could you uh, become an expert on one paragraph? <laughs> While we're here, no, but I could work on it later. You better. Verification. <coughs> just that one paragraph? Yeah, just one paragraph is all. Just each become an expert on one paragraph. Fair enough? Yeah. Which we don't want to together. overload anybody. <laughs> Okay, so this is the Fado, not Phaedrus. This is the Fado, somewhere between 66E and 68C in the Rouse. Engineers, okay, just jump in, okay. Engineers, well, it's for the audio, so people right. can follow. And is not purification really that which has been mentioned so often in our discussion? Wow talks a lot about it. To separate as far as possible the soul from the body and to accustom it to collect itself together out of the body in every part and to dwell alone by itself as far as it can both at this present and in the future, being freed from the body as if from a prison? By all means, said he. Yeah. Is that separation of self and the body stuff? Yeah, that is. That's it. It's very difficult to find a. <laughs> uh, like, I. I really want to ask these guys. I, I went to a group in Poe, that's a regional group, and mentioned Plato to them while I was there, and got a bunch of blank stares. <laughs> but I have not corresponded directly with the original authors. 
but I really want to ask them, has anybody mentioned to you Plato? And if you had that paragraph in your back pocket, pass it around. Say, uh, how, how, how is it that it's invisible? At St. John's when I was there, I mean, they had plenty of good reason for kicking me out, by the way, but uh, they have these final tests called the uh, Donrag, and I wrote on the Phaedo, and I wrote on that paragraph. I would love to read that if you still have it. Yeah, and the dean who who is the kind of a guy when you first meet, you realize you don't like him, and after a while you, were, you decide you were right, right from the beginning. <laughs> you know? You know that, you know? <clears throat> and he said, uh, it's not there. Now, he's a Greek scholar. He wrote a whole book on the Phaedon. And I said, oh, uh, it's there. Wait, wait, wait. What's there? This paragraph. Y did you find it here? I just want to know what the it was. No, that I'm sorry. Okay. But it is there. Yeah. The yoga. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And I, well, said, it's I said, the guy's got a yoga. Yeah. He said, you don't understand it. I said, one of us don't. <laughs> Subsequently, he pulled me into the office and he said, <clears throat> uh, you insulted the math teacher because I had a calculus teacher and he said that the theory of limits is a necessary rational idea in mathematics and I said it is not. It's a psychological term and it has nothing to do with mathematics and that makes calculus chicken shit. He said, Wilkinson was his name, and he said, I'm going to hold up this class until you see it's a rational idea and fits exactly into mathematics. I said, good luck. Held up the class, it didn't work can't make teaching personal. Right. And he got to the dean and said, that guy, Pierre Grimes, is the wrong guy. The so wrong my, guy. So my charming dean said, we don't see, sometimes when you flunk a class, you have to take it over and you get your degree. So he said, it doesn't make any difference if you go out and make up the mathematics in German, we're not giving you a degree under any circumstance. We don't want you to graduate and be known as a St. John. Wow. So I said to him, oh, he said, what are you going to do? <laughs> I said, I'm going down to the uh, accounting, the treasury. I'm going to ask them to make up my bill because when I leave here, I'm not going to. Make, I'm going to make sure that I don't owe you guys one penny. You have a right to do what you're doing, but I think it's all bullshit. I didn't say bullshit at those days, but I, I do now. So that's that's a memorable paragraph in my history. But it leads back to the question that you not there asked. I said it's yoga. It's a yoga. Yeah. But how could he write a whole book and ostensibly have gone over the Phaedo so many times? And he, he could you translate know. it like reading the New York Times in the morning. Probably could read it directly. Yeah. So... It's not there. How could he... It's, you don't understand. Yeah. It's not there. <laughs> and if it is there, it's not the way you, you take it. So you showed him. <laughs> that was not allowed, but... Uh, <laughs> what? It was not allowed. So it's got a long history with me. Wait, wait. Now, see, you and I have 
danced around on this a little bit before. It may be that since you were there, things have changed. But I've actually read some very exciting things about St. John's College. And again, this may be only changes they've made recently. But they followed this, the great books thing, right? And they, they've been a, a hotbed for inventing this uh, Socratic seminar method. Not Socratic method, but Socratic seminar. Uh, not the one that's used in law schools. Uh, and, and the core of that method is to sit around in a group and look at a text and bat back and forth what the heck that text is saying and to be open to uh, the best argument made about what's being conveyed um, based on text. Now, were they doing that in your time or not at St. John's? Of course, that's why it was so superficial. Yeah, so that's okay. So if they were if they were already doing so, what they're calling Socratic seminar hey, at that no, time, no, you cannot. You would think that to follow their own rules, no, they no. they would say the dean would say to you, "Show me the text," because that's their own method. If you want to <laughs> be so persistent in this rational discourse we're having, I'll have to acquaint you with a couple of fundamental facts. Go ahead. People cannot get into a Socratic dialogue without mastering what a Socratic dialogue is. You can't get a group of people reading a text as we might right now and engage in a Socratic dialogue unless a couple of these people around here know what it is to pursue Socraticly. So. Perhaps the name is incorrect. They're calling it Socratic Dialogue, or Socratic Seminar. But it's really not lifted to the level of a true Socratic Dialogue? You, it's worse than that. It's a myth. If, if you get a group of people coming into college, and you give them a text, whatever it is, and expect out of that interaction a Socratic dialectic will emerge. Good luck; it's not going to happen. So, what would let's let's rename it? What are they doing at St. John's? When you sit around in in a group, and we do this ourselves, we, we you know we sit around, we look at a text, we'll spend time on a paragraph, we'll go over it ten times in, in various subgroups, right? And we try to figure out what the heck is being conveyed. Okay, but you got to ask yourself what's different. What are you going to call that? Yeah, you're not going to call it Socratic. That would never happen okay. in St. John's. Are we going to call? Uh, Look here, uh, is it necessary to get someone up there who knows what's in the text? What are the chances of reading, what are the chances of reading the Phaedrus with a group of people who have no experience of the Socratic world or Greek world and ask, what do you think spontaneously the question might come up I wonder how metaphysics and mythology fit into this work we're dealing with. What are the odds? Wait, so that's a good question. All right, so could you, does, can I, can I take the question you just asked and, and reword it this way? And would it be correct to reword it? Are you saying that you could read Plato for a very long time, not just one dialogue, but the whole set. <coughs> if you live to a thousand years of age, reading Plato fastidiously, you would not come up with that question? I don't know, maybe a thousand years it might. <laughs> okay, let's take a normal life. Then. No, no. 80, 90. No, no, no. You tell me. You were there last night. What are the chances of someone raising that question? Okay, so we could say it's slim. What it's are the chances slim. of someone opening that dialogue with a group of people and saying, hey, you know, there's a curious myth in the beginning of this dialogue. I wonder whether or not that dialogue of Theseus might be a model for the entire dialogue. But Plato itself will not bring about that question. 
most likely will not bring about that question. The question is not raised in the dialogue. Unless someone has already done the homework and comes in with that kind of sin. So what, what's the homework? Become a, that gets that, with that kind of that scene. presupposes that the audience already has an appreciation for the role of myth second as a, as a, as a, as a model right, and then they should be able to see that model clearly in the evidence in the text. Any group of guys sitting around I would say could never come up with that. So well, Pierre, since they can never come okay. up with it, who showed you how to read Plato in this way? Well, oh yeah, that one again. Good <laughs> question. See, I, I I did this work on this on the Phaedo, see, and I put in it that very idea. It's in it. You know, that that's the essential myth, and next to it is Apollo. I, I did it. This guy, the great Greek scholar, also did a great book on Greek, Greek mathematics that he publishes all over the place. Um, it was received with a great deal of hostility. Like that's, you don't go down that road. That's all. Um, St. John's is a myth. <laughs> I told them it was a myth. Pierre's driving the Jeep, he goes flying off the road. He does the question, I know. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> when I was in the second year of the so-called 100 grade books, I turned to these guys, to all the, prof the professors having coffee, and I said, what happened to the Greek vision? We're now in the second year, now that means we're moving into the modern Europe, so I'm saying, what the hell happened to it? It's gone. My third year. No answer, by the way, from no, me? No, 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 no. They didn't even know it existed. Uh, uh, third year, we did all that literature. No. Descartes to Hegel. And I said, hey, uh, there's only one problem here. It's as if the Greeks did not exist. What happened to the Hellenic Age? What happened to it? How, how come it's not in Europe? Christianity? That is a prevailing religion in Europe. Yes. I mean, as, as to what happened to it? Well, or the breakup of the. But you see, that is a, that's a kind of a question where the faculty should be able to sit down and say, "Okay, let me fill you in on some details." They never do that. The faculty do not play a constructive role in the student's life. They. They let them go on in this myth that getting together in these these discussions in itself will generate the kind of mind that is Socratic. It's a myth. So then, I'd like to hold on to Jeff's question, but bump it one yeah. to a second question, which is uh, not only what got you booted up, but what boots a culture into a Hellenic vision? If doing the best you can with some pretty visionary stuff in a rabbinical way, I, I don't want to throw in, right, but, but if the best you can with the best of intentions is still not going to get you there. See, what there does? is one guy there that was the president of the school and they used to make fun of him uh, because he was once Greek a uh, scholar there named Kiefer, president, and he became the president of the school. And uh, he was my advisor on that paper. We met twice, in the, the first time in the mailroom, in passing. And I said, hey, look at the stuff I found in the Phaedo. He said, you're on it, you're good, keep going. 
he said, explore all the myths. I said, wow, thank you. Uh, that's my uh, advisor. They had a fundraising where this President Kiefer met um, uh, one of the big benefactors, one of the moneyed people that came with a checkbook and write big checks to them. And he went to this, uh, I only heard this from other people, he went to this dinner that was, to be, that was planned for the philanthrop uh, philanthropy. And uh, they brought the two of them together and President, the keeper, said, um, what, what did you say your name was? Mm. That ended financial backing of this guy who was so insulted he walked away. And that's President Keeper. Isn't it? He wasn't quite so smooth. Now, he should have been on my committee during what they called the Dawn Ride, where this was going. But he went somewhere and they put the childhood of this uh, uh, stepson of a, of, of a barren woman as his mother. Anyhow, uh, Jacob Klein. And he was hostile to the whole thing, and he was hostile to the Kiefer. So this is this is fourth year then, at yeah, St. John's. Yeah, fourth year. Yeah. So you did a whole four years there. Oh yeah. And right at the end, they go. Three no 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 three days before graduation they called me and they said, uh, and I had to tell my mother and my, my father. They said, uh, what do, what did you do? And I said blah blah blah. They didn't right. believe it. I said well, uh, that's life. You mean three days before graduation, they called in and they said, you were, you're not graduating under yeah, any circumstance? You guys couldn't figure this out about me a few years ago and save me some money and time? Yeah, I only had 152 units of passing work there right. without a degree. <laughs> okay, so I always appreciate, I love these stories, but I'm maybe not having enough coffee yet. I'm trying to connect that answer to my question. Did you answer the question? Well, I was hoping that he forgot it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I heard that loosely Kiefer was the guy that turned him on. Loosely. And yeah, you had yours, how to raise a culture up, that's a whole different he, thing that I would... All he had to I tell me was there's more there. Okay. And that said it. So you had one patron. One. Who could have protected you had he stayed. Perhaps. Maybe. Yeah, I hope so. Or advocated at yeah. least for you. Yeah. So I had a friend about, of mine at the time. I was in correspondence with uh, Joe Campbell, the hero of a thousand faces, etc. all the books on mythology. And I used to have coffee with him in Greenwich Village. Uh, because when his book came out, I said, hey, you got the right direction. Wonderful. <laughs> over coffee. Oh. And I said, hey, Joe, where the hell is philosophy going? I mean, what's happened? It's, it, it's dead in St. John's. He said, Pierre, it's dead all over. It's dead. There's only one place where it's going on, and that's San Francisco. My good friend Alan Watts is there. That's where you ought to go for your graduate school. Yay, good connection. So I said, where? Sampler? Okay, so I got in my 1936 convertible LaSalle and a one-eyed dog and zoom I went. But I had no degree. Right? In order to get into graduate school you have to have a degree. That's right. Mm -hmm. So they never asked me whether I got the degree. So you officially... I had the four years. I had the four years. After four years? So, uh, I realized I'd better get it because someone might look. So I got my BA from San Francisco State College. On the same weekend, I got my MA with Alan Watts. No one ever checks. The dates are exactly right. So when I went to San Francisco State, 
the registrar said, hey, what do you want to get a degree for us? You already got 152 units. I said, well, it's a long story, but um, I need a degree. They said, well, take 30 units and anything you want. I said, I'll take them in philosophy. Anything worthwhile going on at San Francisco State in those 30 units? That well, I found, I found real people there, you know, that could talk. Such as? Well, friends, people who were into it. They weren't into it that the place I went to school in San John. They weren't into it. Hey, they, didn't, they didn't give a damn about it. St. John's College is the ideal place to get a degree if you have money. <laughs> They'll never flunk you. It meant, you know, you can get through with a gentlemanly C and never crack the book. What was it like being a student at San Francisco State? I loved it. Matter of fact, I was one of the people that started one of the first uh, uh, student riot <laughs> <laughs> newsletters, and uh, yeah, we started it. Yeah. I still have one copy somewhere in there. Oh, 52, 53. So I'd like to, I'd like to put forth the proposition. Let me get out of this stupid recollection. Before you refill your coffee. Okay. <laughs> that you already had this vision when you found Plato. Yeah. And so when you found Plato, you went, oh, by, by son. Here's a countryman, right? Yeah. Now I can do some work. Yeah. But you already had the Hellenic vision. From, so some from people. Maybe a previous life or something. I don't know where it came from. But I also was into Plotinus, and no one else was. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Thank you. So here, I made a list. Yeah. Chapters in a book. Yes. On how to read a book. Oh, good. First idea, Jeff says, well, they get together and they bat the ideas back and forth. That's one premise about reading. So, what are the premises about reading? That's another chapter. Three, can you approach reading through a principle given a particular book and a like metaphysics and mythology. Four, how do you read a book? Do you use, with all the, the myths and metaphors and analogies and references, how do you read a book? Five, what happens when you include somebody who knows the book, either a faculty member, and what happens if there are certain hostility to those ideas yeah, from right. the beginning? That's right. These are just some of the chapters that's right. that you'd have to address. And, and I guess the question is, when you read a book, do you expect to have meaning from it? See, and, uh, and, and what, what are we going to call meaning? That's it. Yeah. That's it. That's the question. I'll write it down. Okay. I've been what are you going to call meaning? What are we going to call meaning? Yeah. <clears throat> this is a new method for me, writing everything down and then making stew. Besides, I can work on my handwriting. Yeah, yeah. I like the story I tell you is true. That in 1948, I pulled a book out of the shelf, out of the library, and it was a green book. I still remember it to this day. And I said, "What the hell is this?" And Thomas <coughs> Taylor translation of the Parmenides. I went, "That's astonishing." <coughs> so I happened to run to the same guy, Dean Klein. And I said, hey, what do you think of this? This is astonishing. He said, it's a logical exercise. I said, ah, come on, it's a logical exercise. If I would play it over there, it's a logical exercise. He said, I'll just put it aside. Which is why I tell people when they get into Parmenides, it's just a logical exercise. <laughs> hey, the guy who did Mortimer Adler and Hutchins came out of St. John's tradition. Stringfellow Barr, Scott Buchanan, 
Adler, Hutchins. These are the four major intellectual figures in, in that period of time. They then took the hundred books and put it into uniform edition. They added an additional unit by Mortimer Adler called The Great Conversation. And it was justifying why they didn't include any other culture. And the, the argument is that we Europeans are in a conversation. No one else is in it. And we want to continue that conversation in all of its purity to see how far it goes and its, and its significance. Well, that distills it, doesn't it? Right down to the... There it is. Yep. And one of the guys who helped do that, it was called the Centopicon, I think was the name of it, uh, was a student friend of mine who was a... Uh, he, well, he once used to think, and then he joined the other side and became an Aristotelian. See, I was not, I, I made fun of them for, for four years. And I, I did, you know. They were into St. Thomas Aquinas, I'd say, hey, where does this go? What, you know, uh, what, what? If the book doesn't offer meaning, why are you putting so much time into it? Yeah, hey, Descartes, I'd say, hey, do, do you call this reasoning? David Hume, you call this reasoning? The, the, man, the, the man admits that he doesn't, that he can't deal with the consequences of his own system. He realizes its own inherent weakness and we're reading it as if it's a great work. Like what, what is this, what, this is a piece of crap. David Young, I always did into that guy. I remember the evening I was in it. I said, hey, look at what the guy says. He recognizes that if you're an empiricist and you're going to make your judgment purely in terms of empirical data, you have an inherent problem. And the inherent problem is, how do you know that what you experience within you resembles what's out there? His answer to that was, don't ask that kind of question. It's unanswerable. I said, hey, the guy, the, the guy, the guy doesn't know how to reason. I mean, anyone who would hand me a paper like that in a philosophy class, I'd return it and say, hey, why don't you do some work and stop, stop the foolishness. Jay, hey. I got into Kant, I remember I got into Immanuel Kant, or, you know, the critic of Rainer and Vernuft. And uh, I said, hey, uh, why are we skipping the introduction? The introduction is, hey, I have come to deny the possibility of knowledge in order to make room for faith. That's our culture. That's it. <laughs> why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> Why read any further? <laughs> That's another Christian apologetics. Hegel. I remember Hegel. I said, what are you guys reading into Hegel? Look what Hegel is. He's, he's, uh, he's taking Jewish re uh, religion and putting it into polit political terms. It's just a, it's Judaism. you got Judaism, Christianity. You know, I, 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 was, I was having a lot of fun at everyone's expense. So they're right. I'm not a. I wasn't. A, I'm not a Saint Johnny. I said that's right. I'm not. Well, I left. I said, okay, you're right. I don't have any bitterness towards you guys. Well, you tried, Pierre. I think you made a yeoman's effort to point out. In, well, in I, I could have I could have done it much better, but I didn't. I, I, I didn't have the skills. There's nothing you've said that isn't valid. 
Hmm. You know, if Western thought doesn't offer an, a consistent view that's viable and, and worth engaging, yeah. what's the big deal, like you said? Yeah, like, what do you do with a thinker like Descartes, <clears throat> who says, hey, you know what's fundamental? Um, you have to accept appearances the way they are. Why? Because God would not deceive us. Thanks. Yeah. That's bankrupt. This guy's bankrupt. They accept that as a, a sound reasoning? I mean, God wouldn't deceive you? <laughs> Pierre, especially with their interpretation of Genesis, the way they see that, yeah. Isn't that your yeah. first deception? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Did that Genesis and then <laughs> I said, hey, all you need to do is put a truth table and take a look at what's really going on. <laughs> huh? It's exact like community college. How would you have done it better? You said I've Oh, could have I could have hey, had it had I had some support uh, and uh uh, that really would have been helpful, but I, I was a lone duck, and uh, <laughs> uh, like uh, um, see, one of the instructors in my sophomore year said, "You know, uh, you may be right. If you're right, you shouldn't be here." Oh. <laughs> Good for him. Yeah. But I had a job there. I was in the bookstore, and the coffee shop was right next door. <laughs> and I'd run back and forth. I was, you know, I, mean, I had a pretty fun time in the coffee shop talking all the time. Huh? So the so the upshot is. Uh, the educational system, as at least as we know it in the West, is 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 bankrupt. And your life, I mean, Joe Campbell's advice to you is is a microcosm of if you really want meaning, you got to step outside that system and That's go right. find a guy on a houseboat That's somewhere. Right. That's right. <laughs> and I took. I said, Yeah, that's right. Goodbye. But forget the diplomas, forget the job, forget the money. They may or may not come, but this life of security is not. Well, I just see. The coffee the, the, shop, the bookstore. Yeah, there's, there was another side to it also. <clears throat> uh, I came out of World War II. And uh, I had a very low tolerance for ambiguity. You know? Like, I wasn't polite, <laughs> you know, and, like, I was still fighting. I was still, I was still a warrior coming out of World War II. How old were you? Huh? You were How old were you? When, you? when I got out, I was uh, 20 when I got out of the service. Just, when I, I got out in October and November is my birthday, so I was 21 when I got out. And, uh, and then went to school from 21 to 25, or? Well, no, then I, then I, I uh, uh, a friend of mine who is a uh, <clears throat> really a, a great guy, uh, is a pianist, and uh, he was a medico, medical in the invasion at Salerno, he was going to have a rifle, and he said, I'm not going to kill anybody. And they laughed at him, so he threw his rifle away. And a medical guy was, was killed, and he took all this stuff and became a medical man. So anyhow, uh, every once in a while we'd meet together, when, because I was in a small unit, he was in a small unit, we'd always have a lot of fun chatting. And, uh, <laughs> uh, 
uh, I did some curious things in the service, and it involves this guy, so if you don't mind a story. Uh, I think we'd love to. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Uh, I was in an S2 unit, which is the lowest level of intelligence unit, which really is an outpost to patrols, but mostly outposts. Pretty hard. Um, yeah, they're called down artillery fire, mortar fire, and that kind of stuff, right? So, uh, so we we got into this German, German town, and it's a steep. You know, it's on a hill, and. You can look down certain streets, a beautiful view. And I figured that's the place to go, right, for an outpost. So you can see everything. And when the shell comes, you can run in the back room, right, and come back in. And uh, Al, 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 um, Al Wazinski, who's Polish, he, he was there. I said, hey, what are you doing, Al? I said, you're up, sure. And an outpost, he said, well, there's a piano in the house. I said, yeah. He said, well, I'm going to play it. <laughs> play it. <laughs> the German. <laughs> so he went and played. <laughs> How funny. Were the Germans in town? I mean, like... Yeah, they played in town. This guy, Al Szymanski, in the middle of a war. <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind of a guy he was. Yeah. So uh, after after he got out in New York, uh, we hooked up in, in uh, '46 it was, and uh, I went to see his flat. He was on Riverside Drive, and I left it, and I walked by the table of, uh, going through the door, and I said, "What's this?" He said, oh, it's a book, you gotta take it if you want it. I said, well. And uh, I looked at it, I said, Essence of Hindu Philosophy. I read it. Soul? Reincarnation? Stuff I never heard of before. See, I got kicked out of high school when I was 16 and didn't get into reading. So that was the first book I read. Wow. So I ran down to the bookstore and I said, on the couple of blocks from where I lived, I said, hey, you got more of this stuff? <laughs> the guy looks at me and says, that kind of stuff we wouldn't sell here. Oh I said, ooh, ooh, what am I into? <laughs> he said, but there's a bookstore downtown that specializes in it. Took the book. Hey, you got more stuff like this? The guy says, go take a look at the books. I said, you got a real good one? So he hands me all this Huxley's perennial philosophy. I said, this is it, this is it. This is what it's all about. So you had that before going to St. John's? Yeah. At least St. John's taught you all your enemies. <laughs> you know, like, when we read Plato, Plato's very aware of who the, the forces are that are working against the philosophy that he's into. And he puts them into his dialogues as characters and brings out the absurdity of their thought and even develops it further than they thought. Like, by going to school, you were taught all of the things that you were up against. Yeah, it's another war. Another war. But I, I, I really, I, I, if I don't stress it, I should. You know, I was a rude little bastard. Maybe I still am, but but uh, I wasn't polite. You weren't mean spirited, though, were you? You're not a bully. Pardon? You weren't being a bully. No, no. no. So I wish I had been, but I wasn't. <laughs> yeah, you would have got. Yeah, me too. But I'm not. Um, but uh, so, in, in other words. You, what you're called being a bastard is. We yeah. can temper that a little. Yeah. We can say, you know, that you were also interested in the truth. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, oh, yeah. And that you had an assumption that there was such a thing. Sure. Sure. Uh, yeah. And 
there's not a lot of people around that, even back then, who were into it. It's, well, just, it's just interesting how, did, how, how somebody could, I mean, for me, college was a lonely, hostile, alienating experience. But I needed to do it in order to get through and, and uh, oh, I, I did degree and stuff like that. I didn't care about the degree when I went. Oh. I, I didn't go for a degree. So I, I, I never went for a PhD. They yeah. gave it to me. It would have been different for me. I mean, I wouldn't have lasted long in that no. environment, but there was something about, I still had this. No. But anyways, the point is, um, either there's no point to anything being anywhere or in any way for any purpose, or we've got to find a way of bringing meaning and insight and growth no. into our culture and not just the words no. that can be bantered around, but a real definition for those things. Well, am I off? Am I, am I off here? I mean, it's cool. no. I think you're right, but I think what uh, I think what Pierre is saying is, without a person in the group that's bantering these words around, without one person in the group with <coughs> a higher vision yeah. to guide that discussion, no, yeah. that's right. I think it goes back to Jeff's question, right? What, that's that <coughs> initial scene. If that doesn't take place, right, in the dialogue, uh, where are you at? Yeah. Well, there was a proposal that some people gather themselves together to do this uh, in a conference or something. And so I'm kind of curious about how, what people would you gather together and how would you put the words out there in such a way as to engage those people that you would most want to be engaged with? And so that's kind of what I'm kind of following here. Uh, I don't, I'm not changing the subject, by the way. You can no, no, it. no, 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 uh, <clears throat> um. I mean, I wouldn't rather do anything than sit around on Saturday morning and hopefully some friends come by and maybe the word philosophy is mentioned from time to time. But if you're going to gather a bunch of people, so that's the challenge. I, I would do this. I would like to do it more. Well, uh, the assumption is that if someone thinks something is meaningful, they have to be able to demonstrate it. They have to point that it has to become visible. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> that's that's unfortunate. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because it's hard. Yeah, the first seminar I went to at St. John's was on Homer. And that's the first time I read the Iliad. And uh, I said, hey, there's a Tiresias that says, he had a vision that could span 20 generations. I said, holy Christmas, what kind of a culture is this? And then all my people around me were saying, well, who cares? And I, you know, it's an old book. It's a, you know. <laughs> all cultures have a relative, you know. <laughs> this one. <laughs> So I went into Homer and I, uh, I said, hey, take a look at the, the armament. And, uh, it's a very interesting. Uh, uh, especially the uh, funeral pyres. You know, that's not, a, that's not a Greek cultural thing. Wood is, wood is not that prevalent in, in Greece. Must be a northern. It's a northern culture. Mm. Where did the Greeks come from? Mm. Where did the Achaeans come from? They must have. You know, they, well, well, they weren't into. See, that's when someone in the group has to have done some homework and say, "Hey, that is either an interesting idea or it is not." The fact that the way they they perform their funeral rites. Oh. 
so all kinds of questions need someone who knows something about the culture that can bring in and say this is significant or there's not you know and, and uh, they have this myth that just get a group of people around talk about great books and it's sufficient under itself to generate wisdom that's just utter nonsense It must take a special kind of person to sit around who has an interest in it. If we keep going around this question, it's one I often have, which is, how does one determine meaning? He, he brought up, you know, the steps to reading a book. He mentioned the last step would be, like, coming up with meaning. He said, that's it. That's the question, is how do you come up with meaning? I'm wondering still, like, how one comes up with meaning. Because if you're going to go to any one of these conferences or get into something important, you want it to be meaningful. So that term itself, I'm very confused about. Like, That's, hey, uh, it's been a question for many years for me. It's like, <laughs> hey, uh, uh, I would say, uh, if you want to raise questions of meaning, you better be around people who have an interest in meaning. <laughs> How fortunate. Yeah. Like That's that all. Guy. That's all. <coughs> you know, I've gone because to conferences in so many countries and, and given papers all over the place and demonstrations all over the place. And the trouble is that the people are there are there not for meaning. Or they have their standard of meaning that's not the same as mine. I was going to say, don't even these people think they're doing something meaningful when they're doing it? Like... Isn't there a level of Well, not really. Like when I was in, in Turkey giving a paper in Constantinople. Uh, I mean, in, uh, uh, well, the other side of Constantinople. Uh, there was standing room on, only in my, in my lecture period, which is very rare. I said, hey, most of the people come here because all the professors come with their families so they can use this as an excuse to visit all of the places in the area. And, uh, they're tourists and they're going to conferences primarily for, for social purposes. And among them there may be some people who are after meaning. But how are you going to define meaning? Meaning is a step to wisdom. If they don't have an idea of wisdom they can't deal with the idea of meaning. Like the, the uh, one very good example is the University of Santa Cruz. Uh, I was invited to give a demonstration at Philosophic Midwifery University, Santa Cruz, and the professor of philosophy, his wife, happens to have been a sister of someone who was in the NS group and uh, we've had many talks with her and helped her over a couple of major problems. They gave us for the weekend the Chancellor's home because a group came, the NS group, a good number of them came together and uh, We were going to have a banquet after this present. The chairman of the philosophy department was very thrilled about this whole new advent of philosophy and new shift in dialogue. That's the one. Did you ever hear the story, the one of the greatest stories of philosophical midwifery? Mm -hmm. Even if I had it, I want to hear it again. The volunteers from the audience, someone raises their hand, comes up. And, uh, now everybody is attentive for taking him through a midwifery. The guy recalls when he was a young man in Santa Cruz and they had a big house and rare but they had this house that had a basement and it was the playroom and this volunteer and his brother used to fight incessantly and curse one another and they hated one another and the family would just 
said, go on downstairs and fight it out. So they fight it out and come back somewhat bruised again and again. Uh, the chap who was <laughs> the midwife, the, the pregnant party, turned to me and they said, I hated this. I hated that. I said, I know what I'm going to do. I want to get, get a gun. I'm going to get my father's gun <laughs> and I'm going to put it in my back. And if we get into a fight again, I'm going to pull out that <coughs> pistol and I'm going to point it to him and I'm going to say, if you don't stop cursing me and you're putting me down, I'll blow your fucking head off. That's what I'll do. He said, yep, fight came. He had the father's pistol in his back. And his brother says, you are such a scumbag. And he goes on his usual tirade. The kid pulls out his pistol. His sister's there, older sister. And he says, one more word, I'm going to blow your fucking brains out. His brother says, you're so goddamn stupid, it'll probably misfire. <laughs> there you go. Okay, okay. It's quiet. The door opens. The father looks in, turns around, unbuckles his pants, drops his drawer, drawers, turns around with a bare ass, and lays one of the greatest farts in history. It stinks up the place. Pulls up his pants, closes the door, and leaves. <laughs> now this was told in a right, <laughs> and everyone is, yeah. and I'm going. <laughs> 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 hey. I said to the, I said to the kid, the problem is your sister. <laughs> See, the sister was. What, are, what, is her, what is her role? Was it, what role did your sister have at all of this? And then the out comes the, oh yeah, she's supposed to stop it at the, when it gets really serious. Oh yeah, yeah. And then that guy then gained all kinds of insights into the whole thing. So it's over. See? So, astonishment and applause and I walk out and this professor of philosophy comes over and he says we won't have a banquet and uh, you can <laughs> take your group and you can stay there at the chancellor's house but uh, what you do no one else can do some people can read the entrails of a duck and figure out the future you're like one of those goodbye wow. <laughs> So we had a ball, we had some pizza and had beer and we had a good talk. So Pierre, this is a question that often arises in my mind also, which is to say that there are many of us that have practiced midwifery, me now for almost 18 years. And still, when we dive into it, we dive into the logos, we dive into the words and the dreams, we don't necessarily have the same level of insight as you. Now, God forbid I should compare myself because you the originator have been doing it for longer than I am alive. But it is hard to do what you do. So, I mean, what would you say is the difference between those people like us who are practitioners and those people like you who are much more of a, a master chef or it's very, sharpen your knives better than it's us? It's because very simple. Uh, talk should be reviewed. And you have to ask if there was something going on that you missed. Why did you miss it? Okay. That becomes a midwife problem. So the next level, which is why did the midwife... Sure. When, when the midwife's vision stop them from seeing? Well, I mean, uh, take last night. There were some dreams. Uh, did you happen to have noticed there were some dreams last night? Curious. Uh, what did you find curious about the part that I pick up? Mm. I don't know. Uh, anybody else help on that one? Sometimes I thought you missed a significant part of a dream Good. yesterday, and so I. I 
confronted the individual about it. Good. Um, the dream was a great dream about a pro who comes and gives a straight story, a oh, real yeah. nice, yeah. honest account of a situation that's clear. Now, I don't know what you did with that, but there was something else when she got into the panic attack and how she had to finally resolve it by saying, this is an alpha, alpha animal that is going to, um, I have to submit to. Mm -hmm. Will this be an alpha animal I have to submit to? Push your head up. And so, and I just thought that was really interesting language mm -hmm. and worth exploring. I talked to her about it and it, it seems like part of the panic attack is the struggle between alpha personalities and submission. And that very thing brings up the panic. And so I, so we talked a while and it kind of got around to um, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> what is the submissive part? Because when the submissive part functions, the panic attack goes away. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> what, maybe it's not the, sub submissive may not be the word you want. So we worked with that idea of submissive uh, as opposed to dominant. It was pretty good. You know, because submissive turned out to be her when she's happy being her best and simplest and most straightforward and the alpha male can't beat her up. The alpha state. And, the, and See, what that, sh <coughs> what that shows is that there's more than one way of looking at a dream yeah. and you focus on a key part and it revealed something worthwhile. I think it did, so I don't know. And, and no, no. why you take what you do, you know, I'm sitting there every Friday night and say, what the fuck is he talking about? Because um, he's he's got all these long-term dialogues going on. He's got, some of them have special language, you know, because they've been going on for a while. But what you focus on is like, a minute later, I realized, well, he just asked that, and that's why that person's responding. Go back a minute and say, how did he come up with that observation? So, what you're doing, the, what was his question? How, how did, what do you notice about the parts he fixes? Yeah, what do you notice about the parts he fixes? It's, I noticed it's common in Nabu across in, them, right? In Nabuya's dream, in Nabuya's dream, um, right, you went to, uh, uh, I mean, uh... Well, hold, hold just for a second. Okay. Let's stay on this. Okay. So... I saw the problem as fundamentally she did not see a difference between that voice that dominated her, which is, you're not listening to me, or that, and the crow's voice. Okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. And since she didn't see any difference between those two, I said, hey, you have to appreciate the crow's voice. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, one of the interesting things about dreams is that there are key points in a dream, more than one. I only picked that. You picked another equally good. Well, so yeah, let me I'm ask you, why did you pick on it? Yeah. Uh, right? Because I thought the language was intriguing and in some way pointed to a, a very interesting dynamic, yes. a drama. So you have to appreciate that to see it. Uh-huh. Yeah. So. And, it, and people who don't appreciate, especially the term alpha and alpha dog, if they don't have that it's background to appreciate that image, they're not going to see its value. Right. Yeah, to necessarily. And that was an obscure point, I admit, considering oh. that the dream is saying, hey, you've got a very nice voice. And uh, it's, 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 it's not even very well concealed. No. Well, if you can see. If you can see, yeah. So you came with that appreciation, then you can see. Yeah. That's what I'm saying at places like St. John's, unless you come with some appreciation for the material that you're dealing with, you're not going to be able to Well, that's why I started that list. What just by it, reading it. What is it going to make, what, what difference does it make unless you have some premises for yeah, reading? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. But uh, so, Brian, I, was Brian. Brian. I was just trying to answer your question. Uh, um, with Nabuya's dream, um, I noticed right that uh, you didn't uh, deal with the what seemed like the apparent problem, uh, right? That with the bags, and, oh. right? But you went for uh, like that appeared like a problem. It was a problem in one way, but then going for the really root problem of having all the clothes anyway, right? Yeah. Um, which was interesting um, because uh, it seems like on the surface, like, oh, there's the problem. No, no, right? Really, you're focusing on the root. Yeah. Um, and then in Julie's dream, which was just incredible <clears throat> to see. Um, um, focusing on the parts, settling right uh, with the uh, uh, bus driver, and you settled for that answer, and bringing out that dynamic in that part, how it fits, right? Oh, it's running through all of them. Uh, so that's what I noticed uh, about the parts you're focusing on. <laughs> See. <clears throat> Do you think a group of people without any background in dream work just coming together can crack it without any background? As a, you mean as a midwife? Explorer? No midwife. Just a group of people are now coming together for the first time and looking at a, one of their dreams. Are they on mushrooms? What are the chances they'll be able to crack it? Um, are they under the influence of psychedelic drugs? <laughs> <laughs> that might help. I, I with, with you, with a midwife there? No, 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 no midwife. Yeah, oh, it's impossible. Yeah. That's the same thing with the text. Impossible. It's, it's That's impossible. the same thing with the text, or great text. Well, so then, if it's impossible, how did he do it? How did he do yeah, it? Yeah, that it goes back how to your question. How did any Greeks? <laughs> your question. Where does it come from it's then? Impossible. Where does it come from? Highly unlikely, sure. Well, it can't be a one-off because then we've all been we've all been conned. So there's something about that that needs to be. What do you mean done. a one-off? Well, it, what Pierre did was pretty amazing, but if it's what Pierre did, then we're all fucked. Um, <laughs> if if it's something that we can all do, participate and engage in, then thank you, Pierre. But you did it. Yeah, I don't. How are we all fucked. You did it. You 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 are the example. You picked the alpha image of the Alpha, and you opened up that dream on another level for Lily, you're a midwife. Yeah, I get that, but my question is, mm. um, not that question, but given any group of people, um, we can't dismiss the unlikelihood that any group of people could do this because Pierre's done it. Because that would put the whole, like I just, I'm repeating myself, the whole value of this process on Pierre, and we're all not willing to do that. We're all willing to, we're all trying to say this is something that we can engage in. But he you. came up with it I, I initially. But he came up with it, but yeah. in, in your experience, <laughs> is there anything he's come up with that you can't verify in terms of other sources? Yeah, that's why I hang out with him. <laughs> what do you mean? Who, who else have you met that can do this? Well, the fact that, okay, well, he's in a tradition that we all ascribe to, but in that tradition, I just... I, yeah, well, yeah, I, like, I, is there... I mean, the fact that Pierre brought it all together doesn't... Be, it belies the fact that he brought it all together because it was there to be brought together in the first place. And thank you, Pierre, for being, you yeah. know, in, in between there. There's not too many like you, but that doesn't preclude the fact that maybe we would also like to participate in that kind of scene. And how? Yeah. And, and so... It's fundamental I mean, to... I like his question. I like his question. But see, it's fundamental in our culture. What is, it, what is it about our educational system that is fundamentally against this idea. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Okay, what it is. We believe 
that anybody can become educated to become a doctor, lawyer, an Indian chief, anybody. It doesn't require any personal characteristics, it doesn't require any personal growth, it doesn't require they have developed in any particular way. Like that is curriculum. education. You will not tamper with the individual. They can go through a whole system to get a PhD or an XYZ, and they will be essentially the same. They'll just be given data, which will allow them to function on a higher level. Right. No, no fundamental change. No meaning. No reason. No meaning. No, right? no meaning. No vision. No growth. That's right. They have no vision. Like a person has to have vision to be truly a master of those things that you listed. But yeah. that's not the way our education system works. <clears throat> And to be able to crack the dream opens up the world of meaning. Yeah. So no wonder no one can do a dream, right? If, well, if, they, the, if they have this, if this is the background. They I mean, think that they should be able to read a book and apply it. Right. Take a lecture and do it without having to go through any self-seeing themselves. Could you have done what you did five years ago? I would have wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> I've gotten a little better at keeping myself out of it and just going with the topic. Yeah. Which is what had to be done like yesterday. Yeah. yeah. If the kid had, there was too many things going on in his head. Yeah. That's right. Then you can, that's the yeah. condition for seeing. Something had to change within you or within your understanding. Something has changed, yeah. I think I just got tired of listening to everybody else bullshit, so it's my turn. What do you, th what do you think it is? <laughs> nice. What, is, what do I think it is? Yeah. What changed in him? Parmenides. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> my haircut? Parmenides. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my haircut, I thought you were going to say. No, nope. oh, or that he... I was thinking, uh, at least in the, the trades, it's, it's a lot different than the, than the college educational system like for instance yesterday at work my boss says go fix up the panel like you know and they have never let me do that ever but it's a small house and they don't really care that much about how uh, quality the work is so they like <laughs> send the apprentice in and my co-worker who got me the job is like Jeff's never done this before we haven't shown him shit and my boss said I overhear him he's like I don't give a rat's ass at what he knows he's gonna get in there and do it with no instruction, because if he can't do it, he doesn't belong in this job. He needs a new job. So I get in there, and he's like, go to work. You, you don't need instructions. If you don't know what you're doing, then get a new job. You're out of here. Now, after I did it, you could see, like, the beginning part of it wasn't so good, and it, it improved as I went along. As I, I've seen what they've done in the past, I'm like, and I know essentially what it should look like. Not to say that I can always do that, but I'm yeah. getting there. He's like, yeah, you did a good job. Here you go, and you understand what was happening. But I heard that in my school, too. They said, within a year, most of the apprentices would quit and do something else because you're not cut out for it. You, won't, you just won't click. Our not cut out for it means what? You, you're uh, whatever your mind is. Yeah, you're, didn't, you're set up to do something different. Right, it's didn't click. You and know, that's like, what we're talking about. You didn't see it. <clears throat> it's not you. That vision is not within you. You didn't right. get it. You're not. You know. Maybe you can't. Well, they don't have an explanation of how to teach it to you. It's <laughs> we can show you the beginning, but from there, you got to learn it. You got to live. I found that like I just make a mistake over and over and over, and then it's like, okay, if you don't learn how to correct that mistake, then it's time to do something else. Like you're in the wrong field. That's right. You, know, there's, you learn it. They can't just teach you everything there. They can, you know, like for me, I'd say, show it to me once and then let me do it and don't tell me anything. And then when I screwed it up or or if I could have done it better, mm -hmm. show me how, and then I can say, okay, cool. I see it. Now uh, let's see what I can do on my own. No, now your mind is receptive and you're open to it and you can learn. It's rare. Most people quit. Yeah. Well, let's see, or they say the percentage is pretty yeah. high of people that just walk away. Yeah. Early on, I thought, man, I think I'm in the wrong spot. 
it's not clicking. <laughs> not now. You know, it takes time. It takes time. Yeah. Well, you had to be willing to tolerate being ignorant. Oh, like yeah. You had to allow yourself to stay in that state of not knowing and sit there and be like, fuck. <laughs> fuck. What the F is going on? Or how am I going to figure this sure. out? And then the, the first not few... run from... From being afraid of that state? The first few months were rather frustrating and it wasn't because the work was hard it's, I just don't know what to do <laughs> do I do this, this or something else that I couldn't even consider it's getting to the point now where often I have a clue of what to do not always but uh, they're a lot happier with me now they go do this and I can get it done it seems to me that's Allegorically similar to the yeah. breeding group, right? That's right. right. That's, that's what I'm right. saying. That's your like point. The, yeah. okay. the, the education system in terms of the trades is very different than uh, than you know, real life. A regular college kind of go get a degree and do a job there sort of thing. You know, your school that you go to for the trades it's very minimal. They can get you the basics, but there's you're gonna walk out thinking you know a lot, and then you're gonna get smacked in the head saying you don't know the crap. <laughs> That's right. We just gave Time you to some, learn. <laughs> we just gave you some Lego blocks. You gotta put them together. Time to learn. That's right. So that's apprentice learning. Right. Right. That's uh. And that's what that's what used to be. So, right, you want to be a doctor, go hang out with doctors. Yeah. So in apprentice learning, it sounds like one of the functions of the teacher is to, I'm going to put this word on it, I don't know if it's appropriate, is to gatekeep, is to basically say, uh, looks like you can make the jump and I'd suggest you go fish. Yeah, that's right. But in a mass assembly line type education system uh, we just let anybody through who can walk out with a bag of Lego blocks jump through enough hoops yeah. and it's not important that they see a unity no it's not that's right the instructor at my school with our final class you know there's like 16 or 18 of us that are we all have to do one project together which is interesting because when you're like oh you mean I got to work with these idiots or I, I these guys are cool but these guys here don't get it and I mean we are actually my grade depends on them too <laughs> that, that was rather interesting is they the, my teacher chose me to be the foreman of our class now, the other four guys that I thought were pretty good, I would take them aside and be like, I can't tell you guys what to do. You know, just because I got assigned this position, it doesn't really mean I know anything more than you guys. We're all in this together. You got to work with me. You know, uh, we got to watch out for these other dudes here. They're going to root. They're going to take us down if we don't uh, band yep. together here. That's like, right. You know? <coughs> and the instructors, the lab instructor and class instructor, they're like, they pull me aside, they're like, who do you think's really, you know, who would you be okay with, you know, having your job in this? And I said, this guy, this guy, this guy, or this guy. If you picked them to do what I'm doing, I wouldn't have been mad about it. And he's like, yeah, those are the same guys, I think. He's like, you guys are all going to do good out there. The rest of them, eh, probably not. So how do you like doing your instructor's job? I'm not in it. No, they told me I would be good at doing what I did in that class in eight more years. <laughs> They're like, you're not, you know, you'll get out in the field and you'll realize what you don't know. So mm -hmm. You'll be good at what you're doing now, but it's going to take you a long time to get to there. And I was like, okay, that's cool. Yeah, they're going. <laughs> there it is indeed. And yeah, in terms of what they're saying, I would way rather do that kind of thing than what I'm doing now. But uh, as my current boss told me, he's like, yeah, you'll probably be good at that, but you got to learn a lot of stuff can't tell another guy what to do until you know how to do it yourself. That's a key. <clears throat> well, that's what the group of people getting around and trying to unlock right. the dream wouldn't have then. Right. You know, they right. might have integrity and openness, but they wouldn't have also <coughs> the structure and the language and 
the guided steps that we've been given. I mean, I could write down the steps to a midwife talk, like from what I've been demonstrated and read in the book, and that would be then like the uh, conceptual understanding. They wouldn't have that kind of language to fit their to fit their reflections through. So they might come up with meaning, but it doesn't really mean that they would then know how to nurture it or what to do with that or where it would fit in the next step. Their hope would be uh, openness and in integrity. They want to have. No, yeah, hey, we're here to learn. That's what you said. Be around a group that's into meaning. So could we do the uh, the first? Could we do a Parmenides behind the idea of meaning? Instead of the one, if so that in the fourth hypothesis, meaning would be something that would be separate, yet all people would ascribe to it, and yet not be able to participate in it, but only in a likeness or in a certain way, in a certain as way. as a consequence of not being completely dissolute, that they're brought together as. Um, um, they're brought together by an idea or a class of ideas that seem to have something in common as parts to a whole. Right. Now, what would happen in the second, third hypothesis? Mm -hmm. Meaning would be something that would permeate life, mm -hmm. but <clears throat> but not but not be integral to life. But not integral to it. And <clears throat> whereas in the second hypothesis, meaning would be the sole driving force behind everything that went into engaging the second hypothesis. That's what happens. I'm, I'm Interesting piece of work. By the way, never studied in St. John's. Yeah, too bad. Well, actually, I'm kind of glad. Because that means... And, hey, I would say the fool, the most, one of the most foolish things to do is to try to get a group of people without any background studying Plato's Republic and expecting them to reach the level of meaning. <laughs> Ain't gonna happen. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I was in Arkansas. We had a Buddhist study group, which was a joke because we'd read a few pages or something and then the instructor who wasn't a Buddhist herself and had her own agenda we would open it up to discussion of what you thought it meant and people came up with all kinds of various stuff I'm like, it's right here yeah. it's not what you think <laughs> it is right in front of us and so after a while of me going on, they said, shut up, we don't want to hear you anymore. Well, early on, some of the guys there did, and then later on, the, the group dynamic changed to shut up. So I, I said, okay, I'm going to just shut up. At least I'm not at AA. So, uh, That's <laughs> yeah, well, were you, were you hiding? What do you mean? You studied Buddhism and meditation in this oh, group they for admit, how many years? They admitted that I, mo that I knew more than them. They still said, shut up. Okay. We don't want to hear it. <laughs> and I, I got it. I was like, okay. I'm just going to be quiet here. <laughs> mm. They don't. They didn't want to hear it. Is this why perennially philosophical traditions have traditionally been shielded from public exposure? in various cultures because of the ridiculousness of doing that with the general untrained public? No, I think you can do it in, in public because they're not going to see it. <laughs> hey, your talks are on YouTube. Yeah. We have never, as far as I know, excluded anyone from a Friday night meeting or That's anything. Right. Even when we fought amongst ourselves, <laughs> people want to come. <laughs> people want to come back. Then they may they may be risking a great deal. We 
did yep. say once, Jeff, the uh, the nice thing about cultural relativism is that they don't kill us. They Isn't that nice? Anything. Isn't that nice? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, it yeah, mean yeah, anyway, so yeah, no need yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> he comes back and saves us. Yeah, yeah. Like, what are you worrying about? Everyone has rights of their own ignorance. I mean, opinion. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Which hypothesis are the relativists? Oh. I think that was eight. Yeah. It's eight. Depressing. <laughs> <laughs> well, the problem they don't is kill you. <laughs> yeah, it saved our life. The, yeah, right. The problem is <laughs> not the AIDS. The problem hung is long ago. Dude. <laughs> eh? Otherwise, it probably would have been hung long right? ago. Right. Well, but the problem is not the AIDS. The problem is the fours. Oh yeah. I I don't get the Inquisition. <laughs> I'm not hung so much. <laughs> Shucks. <laughs> How's uh, Jesus and Socrates going? Is that out the door? Uh, I gave it uh, to Kathy. To she got a cover now, and she's now struggling. According to Nancy, she's reading it with a pencil in her hand, and she's dealing with something called the Oxford comma problem. What's that? What's the Oxford comma problem? I learned that the Oxford comma problem is that in the past people used to use a comma in a certain way. Oh. After the word for, before so, but that is no longer uh, in use and it's in on my text and she's uh, making points about how to eliminate it. Uh, oh good, we'll save money on ink then. Oh. <laughs> uh, I, the compound I just, complex sentence. Yeah, thanks. And uh, this war over commas is really a significant. Um, I've been told I use them as a sower sows the seeds across the fields, you know, just scatter them here and there, you know. Well, but that's, that's good news then, because if you're down to the commas, we're on the verge of... Oh, yeah, it's finished. Yeah, it's finished. The length of your the, your syntax and the way Juan does syntax in his translations require some kind of creative, innovative use of punctuation, I think. Yeah, you've gotten the uh, unfolding truth, huh, right? Yes. I haven't looked at it. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, I should look at it because no. uh, the... It's fun looking at your commas. Uh, a lot of times, the only way they can be eliminated is to recast the sentence. See, and that's, that's it's the way I think bit. is I use commas yeah. for pauses. Uh -huh. Well, and, leave the, leave the, the suckers recast. in then, I say. Yeah, dude. Leave them in. Imagine that's if somebody my view. did that to Proclus. <laughs> like that's what I'm saying. Proclus. I said, if it's a good place yeah. to pause, stick them in. It's not. A, it's not a. It's not a meaningful discussion. But there, there, uh, there, there is a fix, and I'm glad you're having fun with it. Oh. No yeah, way. But. If somebody had ever edited Proclus, I would be upset. Like, he'll write a, a sentence that's like a whole paragraph, and it's a complete whole though, like from beginning to end, and it proceeds and reverts upon itself, and that there's commas and <laughs> semicolons all over the place. And, I wouldn't have that any other way. Are you kidding me? Like, well, maybe we should tell Kathy. Well, I I had planned to. I thought she was here to do a dream this morning. Hmm. Yes, she did have one, didn't she? Yeah. Well, if you ever listen to the people that have been in this group for a while, reading even the route, any one of the translations, when you listen to them reading, they will add commas that aren't there. You will hear pauses that are not like on the page. Hmm. But I, from what I understand, Plato didn't write any of those in himself, so it was somebody else who edited that in himself. So when we do it too, you come up with a spot, hey, that's important, it's time for a pause. <laughs> <laughs> we come up with a new punctuation, like the, like the star symbol. 
<laughs> so, so yes, uh, it should what's... it it should be out. I hope to get it out. Good. Then what's on the horizon? And then there's next? Uh, another on the horizon at the same time, which is seven dialogues that I've done that are ready to go, d uh, depending upon the war with commas. <laughs> And uh, Return of the Gods, as you know, uh, still lingers in the background. And then I have six dialogues on dreams that uh, Nancy's thinking of correcting. But all kinds of problems in the house prevent that from taking place right now. Just off, just off the top of my head, um, the problem with commas is um, a problem of um, appreciating. I just had this thought about what Greek does with language. It is you can visualize it as a circle. That's why they call it a period, a cycle. Periodos. And they use the periodic style. And so, I, one, I was thinking, I wonder if you could capture all Greek writing in terms of circles. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, like mm -hmm. each, each each major thought is a circle. Of course, mm -hmm. it is because mm -hmm. it's a period. But also, uh, that circle allows you to draw larger and larger um, cycles mm -hmm. of interrelatedness. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's the problem. Western thought has the simple, the compound, the complex, and the compound complex sentence. You're limited to those things. Mm -hmm. The the idea of a period doesn't fit our structure we we don't get to think in terms of big circles when that's right and so if you're limited to the compound complex sentence then you're limited to it then you're given a certain set of rules for punctuation which can fit within the confines of the compound complex sentence mm -hmm. and slightly beyond but it doesn't account for periodic thinking that's right there's a there's a style of punctuation and, and what it means is that you've really got to be a master of the semicolon and, um, and uh, parallel structure to restate things that have been left out mm -hmm. because that's a big part of it. Um, because the subjects get dragged you know, for a long way before you get to see them again. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to be able to uh, reconstruct the thought, use semicolons, and um, Oh, and I so think good. you need to have a new set of rules for commas. Not the, not yours, by the way. No, no offense, but not yours. Um, but uh, but there but there is a kind a style of thinking. Yes. In yes. In, in English, in in modern thought, which is the compound complex sentence. And it, that's right. It, it and so all your problems with punctuation come from that. Yes, I think so. It's well started. Aren't you uh, supposed to give us a lecture on how to use the semicolon, Dave? Yeah, I'm pretty, yeah. saying that for a few I'm, years. I'm seeing an article or, an, or a short <laughs> essay coming up here that gets published. <laughs> I'm having too much fun thinking about writing articles. Mm. <laughs> lots, of, lots of good insights. There's so many good articles I think about. I don't have time to write. Hey, you got a you got, I got great like six articles here. Is that like the way I used to think about girls in high school? That's the way I still think about girls. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> what do you mean? How much fun it would, uh, it would be to be with them physically, but not actually be with them? <laughs> wow. Like fantasizing about being with girls, but not actually being with them? You, you've kind of cut me to the quick here. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. Sorry, my friend. Be, be gentle. Be gentle. I, I, I'm suffering a bit of a dry spell. Oh. And, and, and so I don't mind that with the women. Fine. I don't mind that with the women as long as the articles come. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've got a few uh, potential volunteer editors around this circle, so. Got All of them are women. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I'm just saying you're in that uh, Iron Sutra. Well, I was just going to underline Jeff's point. There's a sentence in there that had me curious. Shall we? Are you ready to go, or shall we finish? This will bring us back around to your question. Maybe a problem of a comma. Uh, no, it's not. It's um, 
but hey, Jeff, makes you feel better or worse. I came I up with that, that point when I was like 20. With, maybe this, with the like commas or with this? No, not the commas. Oh, yeah. the question about how did he? Yeah. Okay. This is nothing new. This is new, right? Has anybody else hit him up with this question over the years? Probably everybody, right? I don't know, but I remember raising it when I was like 20, so it's nothing new to me. <laughs> You got a face that looks 21, so I don't know how many years we're talking about. Yeah, well, all my hair, so I don't look 21 anymore. This is where that happens. Okay, what do you got? All right. He's in chapter one. This is chapter one, page four, right? Right up. Ooh, page it, four. Entitled, How It All Began, you know, The Way It All Began, right? Oh, yeah. How I did it. Whatever I said, I'd like to know. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to get an answer to this. Go ahead. We know in advance. Primarily, comma, <coughs> I have had many problems, comma, and I sought some way to get out of them. Yeah. As a result of my explorations, I'm emphasizing the my, as opposed to a we in a midwife pop, right? As a, as a result of my explorations, comma, I have found that the root of my own problems has been the result of beliefs I didn't know I held. Nevertheless, they had great power to deprive me of what I most desired. I, I surfaced them, discovered what maintained them, and saw what factors resolved them. As a result of these reflections, I generalized the process of exploration into a method for discovery. I have presented these ideas in seminars, lectures, and demonstrations, semicolon, and now there are others learning this method, consequently benefiting both themselves and others. And my question, I've hit you up on this before, on a Friday night is, uh, you know, you realized you had beliefs that you weren't aware of, you surfaced them, but this is all first person singular. This was without the help of midwifery itself that you did yeah. this. No, I didn't have a midwife. Can any of us do that? Huh? Can we do that too? Oh, I would. I think it's obvious. By ourselves, without midwifery, or do midwifery on ourselves, as you apparently did. Oh. Um, without the help of. Now see. There's a difference between surfacing the idea of philosophic midwifery and then applying it to yourself so that it is not making the claim that you can do it, everything about the nature of problems yourself. That is not true. But you're saying that you surfaced that these I, beliefs that you had previously been unaware of, not yes. just invented midwifery, but you surfaced. Well, I, but you didn't have the problems I had. Yeah. Yeah, what is that? Uh, Yeah, what do we do with that? I don't know. What's different about your problems and my problems that... Such that? Well, uh, um, such that you were able to surface them by yourself? Well, I think the biggest difficulty is that uh, <coughs> uh, see, I'm, I'm Homeric. I'm not Platonic. Which I've stressed several times. Right? That, that's the difference. Uh, what is what is Achilles' problem? His problem was that a belief he had <clears throat> caused the death of someone that was dear to him, Patroclus. Right. Now, uh, I was in the service, and some some things that I have done stupidly caused the death of some very, very fine people who are very close to me. I'm Homeric. I'm same and same as Achilles. And the burden of knowing that you brought to death the people that, that were most uh, central to your life um, played havoc in my soul for many years. 
and uh, it, it challenged uh, it challenged everything. So. Uh, So it forced a puzzle, a question. Yeah. To sort of ruminate. Yeah. Like yeah. That's yeah. This is yeah. Your yeah. For yeah. 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 <clears throat> At least I think so. And then I had other in events in the service uh, that were quite surprising to me. That made me wake up a bit. I think the first one was. Uh, uh, I went on night patrol with uh, two guys, and uh, that was our job. And uh, see, we were be we were behind German lines, and we were then on a patrol, going further behind German lines, see, so that we were already aliens in an alien, etc. And the uh, unit I was with was on a hill. So we went down, go to see where the Germans are, and uh, found them. Mm -hmm. And uh, had a Tommy gun. And the damn thing <coughs> didn't work. Because the German patrol came right alongside of us at night, so turned out I was rather rather lucky that it didn't work because they were a heavy patrol army. But anyhow, there was a lot of fire going on and, and I did a couple of shots with uh, pistols and things like that. Uh, but then, the, see the problem with night patrols is you have to go, you have to come back the same way you went out. But I couldn't because that was the area that was already fixed by the German patrol that we ran into. So you went in and then they fixed it behind your... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. So I had to find some other way to get back into, the, into our own lands. And so I made my way back. And uh, a guy comes up to me when I finally got into our own lines and he said, I want to take a look at you. He said, you know, I had you in my sights all of this time. Number one, you shouldn't have been there. Two, uh, it's night, uh, you look like a crowd. I didn't know why I didn't pull my trigger. I had my hand on that trigger for five minutes, I bet, as you worked your way all the way up, he said. There was fire going on because of the German patrol. I don't know why I didn't pull the trigger. It's just something told me not to fire the trigger. So I'm going to take a look at you. I'm sure dang glad he didn't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I said, so yeah, that's a damn good question. That's why I didn't fucking shoot him. And so, I mean, that, that, what did this do for you when of, you heard that this? Was, that was kind of surprising. Yeah, the guy yeah, looked at it and said, you know, I could have. German line, <laughs> not the way he unidentified. So you walked away from that? Wondering the same thing he did. Like, why didn't he pull the trigger? Well, how, how did I get out of that? How long did you hold on to that question? It was pretty persistent for a while. Then I was also kind of a butt of jokes after that for a while. So. Can you attribute anything later? to no, saying, the so results of holding on to that question? No, there was a lot going on in the three yeah, years okay. when I was in the service. Um, from Italy, you know, Africa, Italy, all of Italy, then southern France invasion, and Germany, Austria. Well, what was puzzling about that? I guess I'm not completely connecting with the mystery of his well, saying that. Okay, okay. What, what a was guy, the guy looks you in the eye and he says, I don't know why I didn't kill you. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm saying, yeah, I got the same puzzle. 
<laughs> now it is a puzzle, you know, like, well, why didn't I? Yeah, you got a trained sniper whose job is to whack guys Kill. like that yeah. over and over, and yeah. he normally would. And so yeah. something told me not to. You should have been dead. Let me you see you. You should be dead. <laughs> and you're here, 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 here. Yeah. And Pierre says, yeah, I should be dead. There, 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 there. Yeah. Why am I not dead? Yeah. Why did you kill me? That's a pretty interesting question. Yeah. Is that a question of providence? Uh, that, that word never occurred to me in those years, but so the, the, the wonder did. And other things happened during the service, which was, was it you know, the, the little, voice equally head, peculiar, but... Uh, yeah. Such as? Oh, well, walking across the field, and uh, we, we got a one one. We finally got a lieutenant. Came out of, right, I mean, a real lieutenant. And uh, uh, even looked good. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. And I'm bringing him back up the front, see? And I'm walking along, and by the way, he's following me, and that's as far as he got. Oh, oh wow. Blew his leg off, bomb. You know, was like, that's thoughtful. Wow. Yeah. So things like that. In the three years I was there, I had there were several events that you might call close calls. He stepped on a piece of, a piece of wood, and uh, he shouldn't have, and I didn't. I walked first. I could have. He didn't. It goes on and on. Wow. So the uh, the mystery that life throws at us, anything can happen at any point. What's the meaning of? Oh well, it's a pretty, pretty thoughtful place. War, yeah. or life, which brings you back to Homer, right? Life or war? No, yeah. like my, my military career was a, you know, I'll tell you the truth that uh, I've heard some stories, Pierre. I, I wish I remembered them all. They would have okay. made the greatest book about <laughs> World War Two ever. I had a top <laughs> sergeant. See, there's only one top sergeant in the battalion, right? Okay. All of you. And he got before a, uh, a battalion review, and he said, I want to tell you guys something. If that son of a bitch, Pierre Grimes, ever gets a PFC one stripe, I'll turn in all of my stripes <laughs> right now. <laughs> one stripe? Sev yeah. yeah, so several Grimes, months later... Did you walk around without a stripe? Yeah, so, <laughs> see, but, see, every time he went to the front, I'd get, I'd get the job of being the sergeant, with no stripes. Now you try to order guys around without any stripes in this kind of a war, it's rather difficult. But anyhow, I did it. So every time, the trouble was, every time I got back in the rear, I did things that would upset people, you know. But, uh, like what? President Roosevelt said, from now on, everyone who's in the infantry, right, automatically gets a PFC. <laughs> so we went back for reserves and to get more ammunition, all that kind of stuff, and the same top sergeant comes out and says, I don't give up. He's still not. He, he was given it. I never gave it to him, so it doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> How many stripes is a PFC? Is that one stripe or two stripes? No, one. PFC, one, one stripe. So I got out with one stripe. So you can walk around in the army without a single stripe. Yeah, that's called the E one. E two is a uh, is a P, is a one stripe. Okay. See, wow. my the, my job He's required changed. a staff sergeant, but you know things I did they they found rather rather difficult, like reading poetry during the war is not a good thing to do on the radio when you're on the front. On the radio, nice. <laughs> you know things. Digging, digging latrines with dynamite. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is where this is where that uh, that series, that the movie and the series Mash came from. Is guys like you, right? And your friend right. playing the piano, right? Yeah. In in the midst of yeah. Yeah, and see, I tend, tended to have weird friends, which didn't help. 
see, what is it like to come out of New York City? So, and I land in a Texas division. I mean, they didn't receive us with great glory. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And they used to sing, you know, the guys of Texas are upon you, everyone stands, and I'd send, and I'd say, fuck you, I'm not standing. <laughs> so I didn't make, you know. It makes sense, somehow, Pierre. It makes yeah. sense. Yeah. I was one of that, you know, uh, the worst kind of unit to be in the service is a National Guard. They don't have the training. Mm. Yeah. And they put them in the front as if they're regular troops, and the, the whole thing is a farce. You know, we, we, there are books on, on my division that uh, went into one scene crossing up river. And, uh, the Rapido? Yeah, Rapido. Uh, only lost 80 to 85 percent of the troops. Sheesh. Is that because of poor training? You know, that's a minor. Bad command. Oh. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Don't want your problem. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well. Then towards the end of the service, I got uh, I was uh, promoted to uh, operation sergeant, which is uh, three down and two up, and they never gave me the stripes. Ah, too bad. I had this behavior problem. Ah, uh, had this what? Yeah, it showed behavior itself up behavior. several times. Oh. Yeah, but that's. That's what a lot of kids get labeled with. It's a matter of what you yeah. do with it. I mean, we can say you still have it. I mean, you called yourself rude. If by that you mean like you don't respect people's boundaries that they want to uphold because you don't believe in them, you think it's better for them to get past them. Yeah. You know, then, <laughs> you know, like I'll take that kind of rudeness. It's the way that you direct it, you know, like yeah. you could still be a disruptor. Of cultures and no, that wasn't a dis purposefully disruptive. It was just natural. <laughs> <laughs> what did you read on the radio? What, what po do you remember what poem it was? Yeah. What? Um, um, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. Is that like Blake or somebody? Um, <laughs> and several. I was really upset the guys. They have a view if you're, you know, on the front lines, you, you should have certain etiquette. Yeah, there's sort of a radio protocol, isn't there? Yeah. The, 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 the poetry part um. isn't well studied. <laughs> Um. Yeah, it's best to leave that behind. Well, excellence always upsets. Yeah. It doesn't fit in the. It doesn't fit into the Aristotelian, the mechanical. By nature, it has to transcend and force. One to look at oneself right? when they're not necessarily ready or want to. Yeah. Enough. Thank you. Look at this. I got two hats now. Five time I got started using my head. <laughs> For Nancy, apparently? I don't know. I don't think so. Yeah, Julie. Yeah, it was Julie Horror. Oh. Well, was this the conference well, sign up or something? Uh, yeah. Oh, contact him. Do you, you want to give it to Julie? Well, oh, yeah, leave it. Well, just leave it here and she'll show up in my talk. Um, I mean, uh, my um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I'm saying.
going to Soka University this